All right, you guys were super fast, super fast getting back, back to where you needed to be. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Welcome. Um, we don't have a video entering in, so I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of jumping in here today. If you don't know me, my name is Mark Fila. I'm the Free Life Director here at Harbor Light. And yes, I'm going to answer your question. Uh, Mark, what in the world did you do? Why are you sitting in a chair? Why do you have crutches? What in the world? Um, so anyway, going to answer that for you. Um, definitely, definitely was a tough week. Uh, Monday, I was at the gym, and if you know me, I, I don't know, I like to have fun and try things that are hard, and so there's this uh, bar that's really high, and I always uh, jump up and grab it and do a few pull-ups on it or something. Anyway, so I jumped up and actually only kind of got it and didn't quite get it enough, and so kind of slipped off, and then like left leg goes up in the air, and then you land on just one, and my knee just kind of caved in on me, so... Um, Thank you for your prayers with that. If you know me and you know some of my story, you know that that's a, just a really hard thing. Uh, I tore my ACL twice in high school. And um, so just even just like all the flashbacks of all of it were, were pretty crazy. But um, yeah, thank you for your cares in that. Um, but I just really felt like God still had given me something to say. And I was like, hey, this is still your week. So I'm here, uh, thrilled to be with you all. Um, I actually had a friend uh, from Denver. Uh, I was texting him a few few days ago asking for prayer. And, and uh, he said, and I just really have been living into this the past few days. And he said, uh, well, Mark, you may not be on your A game. God will always be on his A++ game. And I was like, hey, I can, I can live with that. I can go with that. So while I, you know, maybe didn't have an A mark week, uh, that's okay. God's on his A++ game today. And I think he really has, has a word for you all. So we're continuing in our Inspired series, which is a series uh, talking about the red words in your Bible, which are the words that Jesus specifically said. So they're in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They're oftentimes in red, and they're actually words that came from Jesus' mouth. So they're the inspired words. Um, so we're in week two out of six. And so before we kind of get into that, um, well, I guess we'll kind of get into that, but it's going to be Matthew 4. So if you want to open up to Matthew 4, we're going to be talking today about Jesus' temptation and what he, how he responded to Satan as he was being tempted. And so I kind of want to open with a story or a word picture or something. Maybe, maybe picture yourself or picture your kids if you have kids, but kind of like that six to nine-year-old range uh, at recess. So lunchtime, right after lunch, it's recess. They're out on the playground. Everyone's just kind of running around at school. And there's a couple young boys on uh, two swings next to each other. And, you know, they're swinging. And of course, you know, we're all, we're all competitive and like, okay, who can swing higher, you know, or who can do the backflip off the swing or whatever they're trying to do. And it inevitably happens where, well, I can swing higher than you can swing. Oh, well, I'm swinging higher than you can swing. Oh yeah, well, you're stupid. Oh yeah, well, you're stupid. And well, you're small. No, I'm not small, I'm big, right? <laughs> There's only so many mean things that young boys know how to say. Like their, their, uh, their mean vocabulary doesn't run very deep. So one of them will always pull out the ultimate battle card, okay? And it normally comes pretty quick uh, when, these, when the frustrations start boiling. And I'm going to have you guys fill it in for me because you're going to know what it is. But it's this. One boy says, well, my dad is bigger than your dad. Exactly. So then now the battle has just escalated into some unknown land where I don't even know who your dad is. I don't even know what your dad looks like, but I know that my dad's bigger than yours. Oh, how do you know that? I was just, my dad's awesome. My dad's awesome. For me, I, I, you know, I was kind of a smart or aware kid on some things. And when I was in these arguments, I knew that if I said my dad was bigger than your dad, I probably would be lying. So I didn't say that. I always said, well, my dad is faster than your dad. And even though your dad may be bigger or stronger, he couldn't ever catch him anyway. So ha. So my dad's faster than your dad. Ha. There we go. <laughs> I don't know if he still is, but probably. Probably. Um, anyway, so that was kind of where I always went. And it's funny how 
in the story that we're going to look in today, Jesus continually kept coming back to that phrase. And he's actually, like, in different words, but he actually said, hey, you got nothing on me because my dad is bigger than your dad. When you say my dad is bigger than your dad, you're actually saying a lot of things about yourself. You're stepping into your sonship. When you start talking about how great your dad is, it actually is like, hey, I'm worth something. I'm valuable. I have something that's worth something because of who my dad is. And the sonship, the daughterhood, the childhood, childness that you have is one of the most important things that you have, could ever have. And some of us, we really struggle to step into that. So before, I want to... I want to be clear with you guys that what the word sonship means in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, um, because I know that there are a lot of females in the room, and it's kind of like, well, if you're going to be talking about sonship, like sons are boys, daughters are girls, all that kind of thing, that's very much um, more of a, a language of our culture. And so back in the, in the New Testament times, um, actually in the Greek language, the word uh, child and son essentially are interchangeable. So a son didn't necessarily always refer to it as, as being a boy. It was, you're, if, if it says you are a son of God, it actually means like, even if you're a female, you're a son of God. It's, it's quite interesting, but I'll actually show you this in Galatians 3, um, just so you know kind of what I'm talking about. It says, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I love how it even says male and female right there. We're all one because through our faith in Christ Jesus. So if you're in here and you have faith in Christ Jesus, you are a son. You are a son of God. You are a child of God today. Whether or not you think you are or whether or not you think you're worth it, you actually are. You actually are if you have faith in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to highlight this word children here. This is the one I was talking about. Sometimes it can be, uh, uh, most versions actually say, for you are all sons of God. But um, some of them say children. So it's very, very interchangeable. The Greek word for this, actually, you can kind of see it here. I don't know what all those things mean, but there's word, okay? Um, this is how you pronounce it in English. And you actually, as I was looking this up, and I was like hitting the play button and having the, the, the scholars like say it, you say this, we us. And as I heard that, it was just kind of like, whoa, how cool is that? Because the only two words I hear in there are we and us. And I don't know of any two more inclusionary and not exclusionary words that there are than we and us. We, us, I mean, it, we all fall into that. So this word, we us, children or sons, covers everybody. So females in the room, you're covered. Cool? Good, good. We are all stepping into our sonship, hopefully, a little bit today. So the tension really is this one question, and this one question in, in the temptation of Jesus that Jesus had to answer and, and re-put in front of himself on a very consistent basis, and it was this. Would I rather be fathered or fed? And that might sound a little confusing right now. Would I rather be fathered or fed? But you're going to understand that. We're going to be talking about that through the whole thing. That Jesus keeps coming back to, would I rather be fathered or fed? Fathered, leaning into my father, leaning into who he is, not forgetting who he is. Or fed, I have these appetites. I have an appetite for food. I have an appetite to be awesome, to be better than someone else, to earn more money, to have this or that. These are appetites that we can oftentimes give into that Satan will play on us all the time and say, hey, you should feed yourself. But oftentimes in this passage, Jesus will have this question in front of him, would I rather be fathered or fed? And he's going to choose the fathered route. Okay, so let's kind of jump into this. Let's go actually before Matthew 4. We have, it's very important and, and pertinent to understanding the passage to go to the chapter before. So this is in Matthew 3. Uh, this is Jesus' baptism. So after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, 
who brings me great joy. Every time I read that, I just think how great that must have felt. Like that soft touch of the dove, the Holy Spirit, the heavens, the heavens opening up, and then God the Father's voice just booming, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. What else is there better to hear? So in this moment, this, is, this moment is huge, has so many implications for the whole rest of the world, really. But Jesus is fully stepping into his sonship. You have to remember, Jesus is just about to start his public ministry, okay? And he was going to do all his public ministry in and with the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God who gave success to all of Jesus' ministry, to the healings, to the preachings, to the word. It was all from the Spirit, which came right here. Okay, sounds all good and dandy. Let's go to the next verse. Something crazy happens. This is Matthew 4 now. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. Are you serious? The same Spirit that just fell on him, just landed on him and said, you are the loved son, now is leading him into the wilderness by himself with no food for 40 days. I don't know if any of you have ever fasted from food for 40 days. But if you have, I mean, kind of science can show for a lot of people, you actually start like blacking out pretty often. So I kind of see this and I'm like, man, Jesus, you know, maybe he wakes up some days, maybe he doesn't totally. But I mean, he's literally gone for days with no food, completely exhausted, hungry beyond all belief. Like hungrier than any of us have probably ever imagined or possibly felt that a human body could feel. He's fully human. He feels it. And that's where Satan tries to get him. When his appetites are firing off, I'm so hungry for this and I want this and I wish I had this and I don't have this. That's when Satan tries to get him at his absolute weakest point. So Satan's first temptation comes in. He's got three ways. This is the first one. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell those stones to become loaves of bread. So what in the world is Satan trying to do here? First thing that Satan's trying to do with his first temptation here <clears throat> isn't actually as much of a focus on Jesus as you may think. He's saying, if you are the Son of God, to come down and come against the Father. He's saying... Your father doesn't love you. Your father doesn't provide for you. Look at yourself. You're starving right now. He hasn't given you anything for 40 days. A good father would never do that to his son. Satan right here is trying to come against the father. And when you come against the father and you take the focus off of the father, then the focus can become on yourself. So Satan's trying to get the focus away from God the Father and onto Jesus the person, Jesus the human. So what the temptation really is, and this is in your notes, what in, in kind of in our language, Satan is saying to Jesus, hey, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, God's not going to do it for you. By focusing on ourselves, Satan can attack our sonship. And when he attacks our sonship, it devalues who the Father is for us. When we think less of our sonship, we automatically think less of who he is. And if he gets us to think less of who he is, we're done. That's it. That's Satan's goal right here. He's going right for the jugular right away. Okay, so what does Jesus say? He responds and he says, No. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So in our language, he says, Father sustains me. I can say no to your temptation. I don't have to go make bread out of stones because my Father sustains me. Now, how does Jesus know? How does he know this? You know, because he's in 40, been in there for 40 days. He's got no food. How does he actually know that Father sustains him? Well, Jesus knew his scripture very, very well. And he actually is, when he said that, 
he's actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8. So he knows who God the Father is. During the time of the Israelites, uh, they're coming out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. Uh, God splits open the Red Sea. They walk through it. And then all the Egyptians and their chariots come in and he closes the Red Sea, kills them all. The Israelites are all safe. But now they're in the wilderness. And they're in the wilderness for 40 years before they go to the promised land. They didn't have any food. God had to provide them manna. Now, I don't know if you're seeing some of the parallels here, okay? 40 years in the desert, 40 days in the desert. No food, having to lead on God. No food, having to lean on God. Trying to, you know, have a call to go to the promised land. Jesus knows he has a call in his life to start into his ministry. So he clearly connects, this is what's happening. This is who my father is. I was at the father's right hand as he did all these things throughout the Old Testament. I know who my father is. You can't tell me who my father is or isn't because I know. You don't know. My dad's bigger than your dad. And so I'm actually going to read from Deuteronomy 8 just so you kind of know. I mean, this is what Jesus is thinking. It says this, Be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. This is the Lord talking to Moses. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people, here it is, do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. Jesus knows where he's at. He knows what's going on. He knows he's being tested. He's being trialed. You know what? I mean, it makes sense. Think about father's master plan. I'm going to send my son to the world. He's going to go. He's going to do this ministry. And then he's going to die and he's going to be on the cross and raised from the dead and save everybody from their sins. He's going to carry their burdens. He needed to know Jesus was ready to obey all of the commands from the Father. So here's a test. Here's a test. See if you would rather be fathered or fed. Are you going to stay connected to the Father above anything at all costs? Or are you going to cave into some of your own appetites that Satan's going to try to get you to do? So let's move on to, uh, actually, we'll stay in that. Um, I kind of forgot about this for a second. Um, just so you kind of have a little bit more of a background. Just, Jesus really knew. He really knew this is how God worked. And um, yeah, sorry, I almost forgot about this. This is kind of a fun point. In the ancient Near East, in the Old Testament, um, they're actually, the wars that they had were uh, Yahweh wars. That's kind of what the scholars kind of refer to them as now, a lot of the battles in the Old Testament. Because it was, hey, this city or this group of people versus this city and this group of people, but it was really this God versus this God. This little G God versus this little G God. Which little G God was better? Okay, so they're all having these like, hey, my God's better than your God, this and that, and because we came in and we took over your city. So, um, you know, the Battle of Jericho, this is a Yahweh war, the Red Sea. There's another one I'm going to tell you about um, in King Hezekiah's days with the Assyrians. But Yahweh wars were kind of three things. They were prompted by God, they were for God's purposes, and they were won by his power. Okay, so Yahweh wars weren't necessarily the wars between all the other little g-gods that people worshipped. Yahweh wars were the ones that the Lord, the one and only God, Yahweh, said, hey, this is our war, this is what we're going to do. And then he would come over his people, over the Israelites, boom, crazy stuff would happen, right? Jericho, they march around it seven times, walls fall down. That's not normal war. This is Yahweh war. Jesus understands Yahweh war. There's one in 2 Kings. I actually highly recommend you read this. I think it's very, very entertaining. Uh, it's in chapters 18 and 19. So the Assyrians, okay, uh, they have a king called King Sennacherib. Okay, kind of a 
really funny name. Hey, hello, Mr. King Sennacherib. Uh, how are you doing today? <laughs> you know, like, that's just so odd. Anyway, so King Sennacherib and the Assyrians, they had taken over multiple, multiple, multiple towns and cities and people groups. I mean, they're just ravaging the land and pillaging everything, and they've got it all. They've got all the people, they've got all the slaves, everything. They come up to Jerusalem. They're basically knocking on the gate, and um, the people aren't really responding. The Israelites aren't really responding, so they start yelling over the walls, to all the Israelites and saying, hey, we're going to crush you. We're going to crush you. If your king Hezekiah tells you, nope, stand firm, trust in the Lord, what are you thinking? We've crushed all the other gods. What would possibly be different about your God? So as, as in a kind of tradition, King Hezekiah, in, at the time, the head of Jerusalem, uh, of Judah, he was distraught. God, what are we supposed to do? We're totally overwhelmed. We're totally overmatched. So they go to the prophet. Okay, so the prophet at the time was Isaiah. So the Isaiah is the one who communicates with God, the father, Yahweh, in the Yahweh war, and then tells the king, King Hezekiah, what to do. So anyway, this is what happened. I, I, uh, well, before that, I, I also think that this is kind of funny. When the kings were distressed in the time in the ancient Near East, they would go to the prophet and actually tear their clothes. So Hezekiah comes in, running over towards Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah, I've got something. You got to talk to God for me. <laughs> and now he's like, I, you know, doesn't have his clothes out anymore. Like, please, please talk to God for me. Okay, okay, Hezekiah, I will. I will. I'll go talk to the Lord. Isaiah comes back to Hezekiah and he says this. This is what the Lord said. I will defend this city to save it. For my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Okay, so Hezekiah's got something to go off of. He tells his people, they say firm, this is what happens that night. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 men in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose, basically only King Sennacherib arose early in the next morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. That's what happens when, it's, when the people in that Yahweh war stay connected to the Father. Jesus knows this. He's in the wilderness. He knows it's crazy, but he chooses, you know what? I'm going to be fathered. I would rather be fathered than fed right now because I know who my God is. Let's move on to, move on to temptation number two. We got it right here. Then the devil took him to a holy city, to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, again, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. So Satan, what he's really saying, this is in your notes, in kind of my language, do something awesome. And he's now taking the focus away kind of from the father for a second. And now he's trying to focus on the son. Hey, father's not going to take care of you. So you better do something to prove that you actually are the son of God. Prove that you're the son of God. And he's trying to take it into his own hands. Take care of yourself. Now do something awesome. How often do you, me, us, we, how often do we feel that we have to do something? We have to serve more. We have to look a little bit better to be a better Christian, to actually be a son, to actually be a daughter of God, we've got to be a better Christian. How often do we feel that? That's what Satan's trying to get us to think here. Go do something awesome. It's very natural for us to think that we need to go do something awesome because that's how we grow up. We grow up, we go in, we're in school, we get grades, we got to do better. Hey, perform. Hey, do this. Hey, make more money. Hey, do this, do that. It's, I mean, we're, as humans, we like, we grade ourselves by how amazing of things we can do. So, of course, Satan's going to try to get Jesus to do something awesome. So, Jesus understands this. He understands that, that Satan is attacking his worth. You're only worth something if you actually can do something amazing. And I just love what Jesus does here. This is what Jesus says. He's, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. So in my, in my words for you, what's in your notes, there's no reason to test Father. There's no reason to test Father. 
Jesus, in the attack on his own personal and self-worth that Satan is trying to do, he redirects it to the Father. I'm only worth something because of who my Father is. There's no need to test him. I know who he is. I know how he comes through. I know what he feels towards me. He just told me 40 days ago. He just told me you were my dearly loved son, with whom I'm well pleased. He just told me, you can't tell me that. Because right now, it's not about me. It's about my dad. It's not about me. It's about my dad. And guess what? My dad is bigger than your dad. That's all he's got, and that's all he needs. That's all he needs. Guys, would you rather be fathered or fed? Would you rather be fathered or fed? When Satan comes at you, hey, go do something awesome. Go prove something awesome. Go prove that you're worthy of being a son or daughter of God. Because you're not right now. Go prove it. What do you do when Satan says those things? Well, that's who my dad is. There's no reason to test him, so don't test him. I am. I am a son because of who he is and because of who my father is. That's how I can step into my sonship. And let's move on to temptation number three. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. Satan's pulling out all the stops here. I'm telling you, he's going for every little part of Jesus he can possibly get a foothold. What is he really saying here? He's tapping into this human need to rise to the top. This is his temptation. Hey, rise to the top. Hey, you'll be worth something when you rise to the top. When you're better than the people around you, you'll be worth something. You'll be worth my son. Satan is attacking, again, this humanness of Jesus, that desire to be better than. So how do you actually rise to the top? To, be, to rise to the top, you have to know you're at the top. You have to be comparing yourself to everybody else. That's the only way you can know you're above anybody is if you're now looking around and you're measuring everybody up. Hey, how's your Christian walk? Okay, like you're doing all right. I'm doing a little bit better than you, so I think I'm a son. We get ourselves in huge trouble when we compare. I recently read that comparison is the thief of happiness. Comparison is the thief of happiness. As soon as we compare, we forget our childness. We forget our sonship. As soon as we start comparing, whew, it's out the window. As humans, we have a huge and strong appetite to know where we stand. Where do I stand in, res in respect to you? Where do I stand in respect to you? You know, how am I actually doing? Let's measure it. Let's see where I am. Okay, I'm doing better than, you know, 80% of the people. So I'm probably good. Okay, I'm doing worse than most people. So I gotta, I, you know, I gotta kick myself in the rear end and I gotta pick it up and I gotta be better. I mean, the comparison, I mean, is a total thief. Your sonship, your daughterhood, it's gone. It's gone as soon as you start comparing. Would you rather be fathered or fed? Y'all, you are a loved, cherished, adored child of God. You are. I really want you to know this. When Satan gets us to start comparing, <clears throat> it's really easy to forget those things. I know when I start comparing, I don't, I, none of those words, love, created, cherished, adored, I, I'm not thinking any of those things about myself. I'm either thinking too highly or too lowly, you know? I'm not actually stepping into the truth when I compare. So what does Jesus say? This is literally my, this is my favorite part. Okay, here we go. This is what Jesus says, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. After that, the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus and gave him the food that he needed to live. Get out of here, Satan. 
I'm sick of you. You can't get me because of who my father is. End of story. Stop. You're, you're exhausting me. You're never going to get me. So just get out. Just get out. Just get out. I just love it. <laughs> I love that he can even have the gumption to say that. You know, I've been saying it pretty like authoritatively and loud. Uh, sometimes I even wonder, did he say it like, oh, just get out. <laughs> just get out. Just, I'm, I'm sick of you. you. You're stupid. Just get out of here. You know, this is something that we can totally say. Get out of here. You are not welcome here. Just to kind of refresh here, the three temptations, take care of yourself. To that, we can say, my father sustains me. When Satan says, hey, go take care of yourself. Your father doesn't care about you. You're not loved. They're not going to take care of you. Go take care of yourself. You can say, no, my father sustains me. When Satan says, do something awesome, go do something awesome, go prove yourself. You can say, there's no reason to test my father. No reason to test my father. I don't need to go do anything awesome to prove this or prove that to my father because I don't even need to test him. I know who he is. I'm stepping into what he's calling me to do, period, end of story, don't test him. And if I don't allow him to test my father, then I don't allow him to test me. Lastly, when Satan says, hey, rise to the top. If you don't rise to the top, you're as good as nothing. Compare to everybody else. Compare to everybody else. See how you're doing. Yeah, you stink. When Satan says, rise to the top, say, get out. Get out. Get out of my life. I'm a child. And you can't take that away from me. It's funny, it was a, it was a few weeks ago, actually up in uh, one of the uh, prayer evenings. Man, the Lord put this heavy on my heart and it's just fun to be able to uh, even just give a message about this today. But it was this phrase, it's at the bottom of your sheet. You cannot steal my sonship. No matter what you do, Satan, you cannot steal my sonship. It's funny how oftentimes when you're starting to step into a new thing in your life, as I've been trying to step into this, there's nothing that can steal that sonship from me. You do go through a little wilderness. Guys, I heard that phrase about two weeks ago. And then last Monday, about a week ago, is when I blew my knee out. I mean, Satan knows my journey. He knows how much value and worth I put in my legs. I run, I bike, I hike. I do it all, all the time. That's my joy. That's where I spend time with him. All the time. That's what I do. I mean, I rode my bike across the country, for goodness sake. Like, I love this stuff. So for me, to not have this really hurts. I mean, it, to be honest, I mean, going through this week, it's been a battle. It's been like, when you can't move, I don't know, sometimes I just feel like you're just like no good, kind of, you know? Like, that's, you know, kind of where it comes. It's like, no, 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 you can't steal my sonship. It's just funny how, you know, I'm kind of in that right now. I mean, I know, I, I, I know you all in this room are in something. There is some kind of a wilderness. Maybe it's, you know, one of those things. Go take care of yourself. Do something awesome. Rise to the top. There's some sort of a wilderness in your life right now where Satan's trying to steal your sonship. He's trying to steal your daughterhood. He's trying to take it from you. And I'm sure there's been times when, when you've given it. You've given in. You said, yeah, would I rather be fathered or fed? I'm going to take the fed because that just feels better right now. 
But here it is. This is it. This is, I mean, this is, all, this is all I got today. You can't steal my sonship. We're actually all going to say that together. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be real easy for you. I'm going to count to three, and then I'm also going to give you the pace. So don't say it now. I'm giving you the pace. You can't steal my sonship. Okay, here we go. Everybody together. R loud. Okay, you got the pace. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. You can't steal my sonship. Amen. Amen. Satan has nothing on you if we keep our focus on Father. Our sonship is the most important thing that we have. Let's step into it. Let's raise our hands. We pray for you guys. We do this every week. If you want to accept this today, let's just pray it out. Father, you are so good. Lord, I, I just pray over everyone here that even when we're in a wilderness, even when we're being trialed, tested in every way and the temptations are flying at us to, to prove something, to try to be worth more than we think we are or try to become a son and we don't think we are or a daughter and we don't think we're worthy of it. Lord, everyone's hands are raised to you right now. You see it. Just touch them. They're reaching up for you, daddy. Hold them. Grab them, lift them up, say, I love you. You are my son, you are my daughter with whom I am well pleased. I have plans for you. And Lord, I pray as we raise our hands today and we have the question standing before us, would I rather be fathered or fed right now? We can just choose, I will be fathered. Pick me up, I wanna do what you want me to do. If it takes a wilderness experience to prepare me for the ministry that you have called me to do in my life, that's okay because I want you. I wanna be fathered by you. If that's your prayer today, he's gonna answer that. He's gonna answer that. Lord, thank you for coming in. Thank you for filling us. Thank you for feeding us with who you are and not from some off-handed appetite that we may have. Thank you for giving us the words to fight against our enemy in the spiritual wars that we face every single day. Be with us as we go about this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Love you all. Uh, have a good week. If you filled out one of those surveys, drop it in the basket on your way out. Have a good week.